How exactly did Jay-Z build his empire? Let's start at the point when Jay-Z wasn't a billionaire. He didn't come from the average middle-class neighborhood. He was born and raised in Brooklyn as Sean Corey Carter. Jay was the youngest of four kids, and his family lived in a rough neighborhood. He sold drugs in his teenage years to support himself and other members of his family. In an interview with Vanity Fair, he admitted that his mom, quote, simply knew he was selling drugs in high school, but couldn't do much about it because they needed the money. Jay wanted a better life than the one he had, and he knew that he was going to do whatever it takes. His family lived in a housing project, but when he was 11, his dad left and his mother was left raising four kids alone. We don't need to say the obvious that life wasn't easy for a young Jay-Z. Just to illustrate the type of environment he was living in, at the age of 12, he shot his older brother in the shoulder for stealing his jewelry. Even though he grew up in a tough environment, he still had moments as a young kid, of course. His mom said that he had a passion for music at a young age, that he used to beat out drum patterns on the kitchen table in the middle of the night. It wasn't until a few years later that he'd get a boombox as a birthday present, but his skills as a musician were cultivated at an early age. If you want to be successful, you need to figure out what you're good at in life. Everyone's good at something, and it's up to us to figure out what we're good at. If you don't know how to find what you're good at, just start looking at the things you enjoy doing the most. Most people love to do what they're good at. As Jay grew up and he got deeper into the game, he knew that he had to find another way to get out of his situation. He knew that he was good at rapping and because there was more of a chance for success through rapping than the drug game, he transitioned into music. Jay is a self-professed hustler and he knew that he was gonna find a way out no matter what way it was through. He had claimed from the beginning that he wasn't a rapper, but that he was a hustler. It just happened to be that he knew how to rap. It's one thing to be confident in yourself and your abilities, but it's completely different to stubbornly refuse to learn anything new or accept criticism. In any field, having a mentor or someone to help you expand your views to see another side and help point out any possible mistakes is crucial for success. Anyone at the top of their profession can't do it alone. LeBron, as a quick example, has his own personal team to support and guide him off the court. When Jay was starting out, he did exactly that. He worked together with the rapper Jazzo, who taught him the basics of rap. Does the name sound familiar? Jay was first known as Jazzy around his neighborhood, but he took a similar nickname as his mentor, which kind of says a lot about what he thought of Jazzo at the time, even if he did quickly outgrow his mentor. They even ended up feuding years later, but that's another story. Learning doesn't stop when we get successful either. We're either continually getting better or getting worse, and that's something Jay knew. Jay has had many different mentors throughout his life. He said he learned about discipline and picked up work habits from Michael Jordan. He learned about living life your own way while still being successful from Russell Simmons, the co-founder of Def Jam Records. Learning from someone who's already been through the path that you want to go will help tremendously and save you a lot of time and struggle. Too many people see failure as a bad thing. If someone never fails, they're never getting out of their comfort zone and they're never learning. Failure doesn't mean that we won't ever make it, and that was Jay's attitude. When Jay was starting out, he couldn't get any record companies to sign him to a deal. This actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise, so he decided to start his own label. Rockefeller Records. Together with Damon Dash and Kareem Biggs, Jay said that the first thing they did was get together and come up with reasonable goals for the company and then they set out working hard on executing. Back in those days of the company, they started out by selling CDs out of the trunk of their cars. Later on, Jay released his debut album, Reasonable Doubt, in 1996, which today is still regarded as one of the best rap albums ever. Let's not also forget about the other classics he's dropped, such as The Blueprint or The Black Album. Jay showed us that even though it looks like something bad happens, it's a blessing in disguise. That situation was just a situation to Jay. He just knew he was going to make his own path instead, maximizing opportunities. Even after his success as a rapper, Jay never stopped looking for opportunities to make his life better. Jay didn't believe in staying in his comfort zone or staying in his lane. He knew that he still had opportunities for success elsewhere. Once he had the blueprint for success, he knew that he could apply it in other areas. Instead of just pigeonholing himself as a rapper, he decided to continue his success in the business world. Apart from winning 14 Grammys, He's built an empire of many other thriving businesses, some of which he sold. For example, remember the clothing brand Rockaware? Jay sold majority ownership of the company for around $200 million, but he kept a stake in the business and still actively participates in some company decisions. He also launched his own sports agency, 
Rock Nation Sports. He's bought out the champagne brand, Armand de Brignac Champagne, or better known as Ace of Spades. He's also invested in tech companies, cigars, and a lot of other things we just don't know about. Jay likes to describe all of his brands and business, saying that they're all a part of him and that there's a lot of emotional attachment. We've seen it plenty of times when someone doesn't know how to deal with the fame and the money. The easiest example is with professional athletes, and there are reasons why such a large percentage of professional athletes go broke after they retire. The biggest reason is that cash flow is king. And in all fairness, it is easy to get caught up in the partying and traveling lifestyle. If you think the cash flow isn't going to stop, the next thing you know, you end up blowing a few hundred million like a young Iron Mike. Find out more in this video. But Jay was too smart to make those mistakes. The key thing that Jay did was staying focused on achieving his personal goals. It's not like he and Beyonce aren't staying home every Friday night to read about business strategies, but Jay knows his limits. Even though he's rapped about spending money and partying, he's actually a light drinker and prefers to quote, stay focused on making money. Jay prefers to put his energy into things that will bring him more success. For example, spending $55 million on a horse seems like an expensive luxury, but that was a racehorse with a pedigree that creates cash flow for him. Jay is relentlessly focused in achieving what he set out for himself, and his success and achievements speak for themselves. When you get good at something, there comes a point when you just want to see others around you do just as well as you. Having one of the more interesting rags to riches stories, Jay knows what it's like to start from the bottom. Jay said in a song that, quote, the greatest form of giving is anonymous to anonymous. That's because it's different when people do nice things for other people and then show it off on Instagram. Jay has been using his power and influence to reach other people less fortunate for quite a while. In 2003, he founded the Sean Carter Foundation together with his mother in order to help talented students who struggle to pay out college. But he's also helped out other people who are trying to reach the top. Rihanna owes Jay for the start of her successful career, and who can forget Jay was one of the most influential people to Kanye at the beginning of his career as a rapper. Kanye made an entire song about him. You're only as good as the average of the people who you surround yourself with. Jay knew exactly how that goes. He's extremely careful who he hangs around with. If you want to be successful at something. You need to surround yourself with people who are trying to achieve the same goals. For example, if you're trying to get in shape, surrounding yourself with people who want to get in shape gives you a much higher chance of getting in shape. If instead you surround yourself with people who are into playing video games and eating out, then guess what? Working out is on the back burner. When you associate yourself with people that are trying to get to the next level or are already successful, you're putting yourself in a position where you have a much higher chance of succeeding. Jay was able to surround himself with the right people from the beginning with Damon Dash and Kareem Biggs. Jay kept himself with people who had similar goals from Biggie to Russell Simmons to Michael Jordan. Jay knew how important it is to keep the right people around in his life and keep the wrong ones out. Even for someone as talented as Jay, he didn't do it alone getting to the top. How did 50 Cent make it out of the hood? Let's get right into it. No big mystery here. 50 has been working very hard for a very long time. He hasn't had an easy ride, but he's shown his toughness all through his life. 50 Cent was born Curtis Jackson, and he grew up in a rough neighborhood in Queens, New York. He was an orphan at eight after his mom went in a mysterious fire. He started selling drugs on street corners by the time he was 12. 50 says that a turning point in the way he thought about things was from an older street dealer who went by the name of Truth. Truth taught him not to complain about his difficult circumstances in life. He taught 50 that his hard life on the streets could be seen as a blessing if he could actually learn from his experiences. He also taught him that he needed to always be aware of what's actually happening around him and be aware of what's real and what's not in life. 50 was arrested at the age of 16 and he ended up getting sent to a boot camp for nine months. That was when he realized that the life he was living would never satisfy his ambition to make a name for himself. He decided that he was going to find a mentor and enter the music industry. So 50 began rapping in a friend's basement where he used turntables to record over various instrumentals. In 1996, a friend introduced him to Jam Master J of Run DMC, who was establishing Jam Master J Records. J taught him how to count bars, write choruses, structure songs, and make records. His music career soon started to take off after he met Dr. Dre and Eminem. 50's popularity first began to grow after the release of his successful and controversial underground single, How to Rob. This was a track that describes how he would rob famous rappers, but it obviously was meant as a joke. Why was this smart? Because he put himself on the map with that track. He said that he was just trying to create a name for himself. 
Famous rappers responded to that track, such as Jay-Z and Ghostface from Wu-Tang. Before his career could really take off, 50 was famously shot nine times. This event put a stop on his music career and put his back against the wall again. But again, 50 was tough. He didn't give up. Neither growing up in the hood nor bullets could stop 50 Cent from his success. He took his time recovering from his shooting to completely focus on the steps he'd take to get what he wanted out of life. After 50 was shot, no record company would work with him. But instead of giving up, he flooded the streets with demos and made a name for himself from hustling on his own. There's really not too much to say here, as many people know this part of the story. Eminem discovered 50's mixtape, and he introduced him to Dr. Dre. His unrelenting will and prolific amount of work was what caught Eminem's attention and eventually landed him a record deal. His 2003 debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying, made him an instant huge celebrity. 50 recalls that he used Truth's advice to see past the people who were just trying to use him after he became massively famous and made a lot of money. He was also able to avoid the manipulative deals from record executives. 50 recognized who the snakes were. He also realized that the music game was going to change soon. People weren't going to be buying CDs the way they used to, so he knew that album sales weren't going to get him the type of wealth he wanted. He knew that he had to use his celebrity to help push the marketing side of some of his other ventures. 50 could have coasted after his newfound success and wealth, but he branched out into many other business ventures and kept pushing on. 50 Cent is an insanely disciplined person which is why he has such an abundance of success outside of music. He seems to know how to keep his mind in check despite the pitfalls and temptation that often comes with success. 50 has always been good at going at it alone and cutting off those people who were holding him back. He understood that as long as you work for other people, you're at their mercy. He believes that what keeps you going is to be in the position of having to sink or swim on your own. He thinks that in order to be successful, we should have a greater fear of what would happen if we remain dependent on other people for survival. For him, every move in life had to be towards ownership and independence. When something is totally yours, it's yours to lose. You're more motivated, more creative, and more alive. The ultimate power in life, according to 50 Cent, is to be completely self-reliant. 50's grandfather used to tell him that he'd only be as successful as the people he was hanging out with, and therefore he cut out everyone that wasn't adding value to his life. He only hung around people who helped him get somewhere, and as a result, he skyrocketed to success. Even today, 50 follows that rule which is why he's seen taking pictures with other hip-hop moguls and seems to ignore other rappers that don't have much going on for themselves. 50 recognizes that a person's environment is stronger than anyone's willpower. He truly understood that we're the average of who we surround yourself with. If you followed 50's career, then you know that he's not afraid to take on anyone. However, it's not actually the beef he's been involved in that he's taken on that really makes him a fearless individual. It's his ability to be able to handle whatever challenge in any situation that's put in his way. 50 has gone on various business ventures with some of the biggest corporations in the world because he shows no fear in the boardroom, and he understands his leverage in convincing companies to partner with him. From successful ventures such as his deal with Vitamin Water, to ventures that weren't quite as successful such as his headphones called Sleek by 50, 50 wasn't afraid of failure in order to reach the success that he wants. 50 has also embraced the marketing possibilities of hip-hop beef. Hate it or love it, but diss tracks have always been an integral part of the hip-hop landscape, and this has always been something that 50 embraced beginning very early on in his career. Ja Rule, Rick Ross, The Game, and many other rappers have had public feuds with 50. The most famous feud that 50 was a part of was definitely his feud with Ja Rule, which was what helped propel 50 into superstardom and also what ultimately ended Ja Rule's career. Ja Rule really shouldn't have taken on 50's feud at the time as he was one of the biggest rappers and 50 was only coming up as a rapper and didn't have anything to lose. Ja Rule was in a lose-lose situation, but instead he decided to take it on anyways and we all know how that turned out. For a long time after his initial musical success, 50 focused on other parts of his business career. Over the years, 50 has invested the millions of dollars in earnings he's made from music and celebrity endorsements and all sorts of assets from real estate to stocks and bonds. One of 50's very first business ventures was a partnership with Glacial, the maker of vitamin water in 2004. They collaborated to create a flavor called Formula 50. Instead of taking upfront money, 50 was smart enough to take ownership in the company. He went on to mention his flavor in various songs and interviews. In 2007, Coca-Cola purchased Glacial for $4.1 billion. 50 made $100 million from the deal after taxes. 50 also has founded two film production companies, 
G-Unit Films in 2003 and Cheetah Vision in 2008. Cheetah Vision produces low-budget action thrillers for foreign film markets across the world. 50 also produced Power, a star's drama where he not only co-starred, but also served as co-creator and executive producer. Power debuted in June of 2014 and continued until 2020. The main point is that even though 50 was successful in music, that success was what gave him the start to be able to look for other areas to be successful elsewhere. Just like a stock portfolio, we always have to look for other opportunities and diversify income streams because nothing in life is ever guaranteed. Something 50 completely understands. Even with all the things that 50 does right, we all still make mistakes. In what basically amounts to a petty feud with fellow rapper Rick Ross, 50 was ordered by a judge to pay $5 million to a woman because he narrated and released, let's call it, a private tape she had. Lestonia Livingston was Rick Ross's baby mama, so in an effort to humiliate Rick Ross, he decided to release the tape with his own personal narration of the events. However, maybe in an effort to duck the payment, 50 filed for bankruptcy only days after a jury ordered him to pay Livingston $5 million for invading her privacy. Let's not forget that it wasn't just the $5 million that he had to pay. It was also the high legal cost and the time that he had to put in order to fight the lawsuit that he ultimately lost. Going after Ja Rule, great move. This move? not so smart. He was basically guaranteeing he was going to have to shell out a decent amount of cash. But 50 knew that bankruptcy and poverty aren't the same thing. Bankruptcy is a tool used by smart businessmen to get out of difficult financial commitments on the part of their companies while maintaining their personal wealth. So 50 filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, claiming a debt of around $32.5 million. His assets were listed as between 10 and $50 million in his bankruptcy petition although he testified under oath that he was only worth $4.4 million. In addition, 50 lost a dispute over a failed business deal in regards to his Sleek by 50 headphones. An ex-partner accused 50 of later stealing the design for the Sleek by 50 headphones, prompting a judge to award the partner more than $17.2 million. Legal fees, debts, and disgruntled partners all over the place. But his bankruptcy allowed him to clean it all up. He was able to write off most of his debt while maintaining a considerable amount of personal wealth. Basically, 50 ended up with a clean slate with plenty of capital, connections, experience, discipline, and fearlessness to move on to the next big thing. If you're gonna play the game, play the rules to your advantage, whatever game it is. Billionaire Richard Branson never wanted to make billions of dollars, but it still happened somehow. Let's call it mm, a side effect of his life decisions just exactly what happened. Let's dive right in. Richard Branson was born in 1950 to an upper middle class family where he enjoyed a normal and happy childhood. He was already lucky in the genetics lottery in this regard, but this doesn't mean he was anywhere near being born rich. But he did have a leg up on his competition because his parents were quite progressive. They considered their kids equals and they often gave the kids challenges in an effort to make them self-reliant. That was most likely the seed that started it all. Entrepreneurship was set deep in the Branson kids. Branson's parents were supportive of Richard's ventures from an early age. One big reason might have been because Branson's mom was an entrepreneur herself. Growing up, Branson had a lot of trouble with school, something that isn't that unusual with entrepreneurs. Many of Branson's teachers supposedly considered him to be a bit slow and lazy, something that we all know isn't true. What was going on was something else. He was actually dyslexic. Branson himself admits that by age 8, he still couldn't read and he was hopeless in math and science. According to Branson, he was considered the dumbest person at school. The headmaster of his school famously said to him, you'll either go to prison or become a millionaire. Instead of feeling sorry for himself and seeing himself as a big failure, Branson recognized his weaknesses, but he also recognized his strengths, which was his ability to make things happen. Because he wasn't good with school, he realized that he needed to channel his energy somewhere else. And that something else was monetizing his interests. Branson got into his first business venture at the age of 16 with a magazine called Student. He was looking around for magazines that he liked to read, and he found all of the magazines at that time to be boring. There weren't any magazines out writing about anything he was interested in, so he decided to come up with a magazine of his own. Student Magazine covered all the topics that major magazines didn't talk about. The magazine was started and run in his co-founder's parents' basement when he was just 16 years old with no money. That experience taught him the skills to start running bigger things. Just a short time later, 
Branson started his record business from the same basement where he ran the magazine. Whenever Branson saw a need for something in the market that he was interested in, he asked himself, why couldn't he do it? Branson started advertising records for sale in Student Magazine, and that's when he found another brand new opportunity. That new business was an overnight success, well, for selling records at least, and it was the unofficial start of Virgin Records. How Branson beat the big guys at that time was to sell records for considerably less than the traditional record stores, but the way he did it was completely illegal. We'll get into this a bit later, and that's why the name Virgin was completely appropriate for the company. It was suggested by one of Branson's early employees because they were all new at business. Let's fast forward a bit in Branson's life and look at a bigger example of his boldness. Branson's successful entry into the airline industry happened only because of a trip to Puerto Rico. On the way back home, his flight was canceled. So what did he do? He decided to charter his own plane the rest of the way. But he also offered a ride to the rest of the stranded passengers for $39 a person in order to cover the cost. Long story short, he started doing research into the business. He received a proposal to establish a transatlantic service to compete with British Airways, and he couldn't resist the opportunity. One little mishap gave Bronson the vision to start Virgin Atlantic Airways in 1984. Are you guys recognizing a pattern? Whenever Bronson found an interesting situation, he found a way to monetize it and make a profit. Against the advice of his advisors, he called Boeing in Seattle and negotiated to lease a 747 for a year, just to see if the whole idea could work. Virgin Atlantic was soon a reality, although it almost never got off the ground. On their very first flight, a flock of birds flew into one of the engines, ruining it at a cost of around $750,000. And no, the plane wasn't insured. Having to get the engine fixed brought Virgin over its credit line, and they came close to going bankrupt. Only an emergency influx of cash from Virgin's overseas operations got everything through. However, Branson's path to being a billionaire wasn't without failures. Let's go into one example. Remember when we mentioned how Virgin sold a lot of records but it was done illegally? Although Virgin's chain of record shops was growing, it actually wasn't profitable. In the spring of 1971, Virgin was losing money as a discount music retailer. Its record shop on London's Oxford Street was popular and its mail order business was growing. But because of rock bottom prices, the company was burning cash and digging itself deeply into debt. Branson accidentally found a solution to his company's problems. And that's how he almost fulfilled the other part of his headmaster's prophecy of him in jail. The scheme was simple. Virgin could avoid paying purchase taxes by pretending to export albums internationally that it actually sold in England. In Britain at the time, Music retailers paid a 33% tax on records they planned to sell domestically, but the tax didn't apply to records that were sold internationally. Branson discovered that he could stop at customs in Dover, England and get his export paperwork stamped, and then all he had to do was bring the cargo back home to sell. That way, the company just didn't have to pay any tax. He figured that after just a few of those profitable trips, Virgin would be debt-free. However, after three trips of taking records across the English Channel to imaginary buyers, his activities were discovered by UK Customs. To escape jail, he had to pay back three times the amount he was supposed to have paid in taxes. That experience taught him a valuable lesson. At the age of 21, he resolved to never do anything illegal again. Branson learned at that moment, if he was going to do something, he was going to do it right the first time. But let's take a step back and take a more detailed look at how Branson grew Virgin Records. The way they did business sold a lot of records, but they were still having trouble generating good margins, so they decided to sign their own acts and sell their own records instead of doing it for other record companies. Branson recognized that ownership was important to making a profit. He and his partners decided to buy a country estate north of Oxford and they installed a residential recording studio. The first act Virgin signed was an unusual choice for a record company, let alone a startup. A young musician named Mike Oldfield had spent months perfecting a recording that had no vocals. It was basically a lot of bells and other unusual instruments. It was a bizarre first choice for a company that was intended as a rock music label, but it was a calculated gamble that paid off. Oldfield's album, Tubular Bells, was one of the biggest selling records of the 1970s, and it helped to bankroll Virgin's early years in the business. 
Virgin later signed controversial bands such as the Sex Pistols, a band that many other record companies were reluctant to sign. Branson saw opportunities where other people could only see liabilities. Branson was willing to go against the convention and do the complete opposite of what the trend was. Virgin Records would go on to sign other artists such as the Rolling Stones, Peter Gabriel, Paula Abdul, and Culture Club. By the early 80s, Virgin had become an unconventional big label to contend with. It was all because of Branson's willingness to step outside the box with artists that many contemporary labels were afraid to sign. Let's go forward in Branson's life again. You may know that Necker Island is a 74-acre island in the British Virgin Islands that's owned by Branson. When he first bought the island, it was completely uninhabited. He purchased Necker Island when he was just 28, just six years after starting Virgin Group. The story behind the sale completely shows Branson's bold attitude in life. He first became aware of the British Virgin Island in 1978 when he saw the island for sale. He had actually never heard of the Virgin Islands, had no idea where they were located, or knew that the islands are actually called the British Virgin Islands. At that time, he and his partners were still in the early days of Virgin Records. Branson by no means had the money to buy an island, but he was trying to impress a girl he liked, so he called up the realtor and said he was interested. Luckily for Branson, the realtor didn't know he couldn't afford it, so he offered him an all-expenses-paid trip to see the islands. Branson agreed to go on one condition, only if he could bring a guest. So he and his date were given a luxury villa, and they were flown around the British Virgin Islands by helicopter. The final island he saw was Necker Island. He was stunned by the view and the wildlife on the island, and he decided there was no way he couldn't purchase the island. However, remember, Branson had no money to buy the island, but he figured that he had nothing to lose. He made an offer with the max amount he figured he could come up with from his bank, so he made a lowball offer of $100,000 for an island that was advertised for $6 million. The owner said no and was so insulted, Branson actually had to figure out a way off the island himself, but the owner got over it. After a year, nobody else had made an offer on Necker Island. By that time, the owner of the island was desperate to sell because he needed cash, and Virgin Records was in a much better position financially than it had been a year before. So Branson quickly agreed to a purchase price of only $180,000. The only condition was that Branson would need to build a resort on the island within four years. It's because of these negotiation skills and his willingness to make bold moves that's put Richard Branson where he is in the business world. Branson will be the first person to admit that he didn't go into his first business to make money. He did it because it was something fun to do and he was passionate about it. Even nowadays, Branson's main reasons for entering a business is that it would be fun and exciting. For example, Branson got into Virgin Galactic because it was fun and exciting to get into. Obviously, there's also money to be made. Branson also has a number of achievements that have nothing to do with business. For example, there were his various efforts to break world records for hot air balloons. Branson is also well known for his different way of thinking. According to Branson, most people in business dress the same and that contributes to them acting and thinking the same as most of their co-workers. And that's why he has a distinct dislike for ties. He often carries a pair of scissors with him at all times, ready to cut off a tie of anyone at his company. He even owns a pillow on Necker Island that's completely made up of a few of the ties he's cut off. To Branson, wearing a tie restricts new ideas and innovative thoughts. Embracing change and having the ability to adapt is the only way to move forward for anyone. Here are the principles that Floyd Mayweather followed to make his first billion. If you've ever watched Mayweather box, then you've seen the art of Mayweather boxing. You've seen the ridiculous hand speed and quickness that he was born with. In fact, he's so good at boxing, it was almost boring to watch him fight since you knew what the outcome was. There's no denying how much talent he was born with, and his family could see the potential in him from when he was a little kid. He had a knack for ducking all the punches his opponents threw at him from an early age. His quickness in his lateral movements contributed to him not catching much punishment throughout his career. Mayweather knew exactly where his edge was in boxing. Mayweather was lucky to be born with the DNA he had and knowing where to concentrate his time. Most of us aren't lucky enough to understand our talents and know exactly what we were born to do in life. Mayweather was born into a family of boxers.
His dad, Floyd Sr., was a former welterweight contender who fought Hall of Famer Sugar Ray Leonard. His uncles Jeff and Roger Mayweather were both professional boxers. Roger, Floyd's former trainer, won two world championships. Boxing has been around the Mayweather family for a long time. Boxing has been a part of Mayweather's life since his childhood, and he never seriously considered any other profession. He credits his grandmother as seeing his talent first. Mayweather has said that she discouraged him from getting a job and encouraged him to stick with boxing. He took his grandmother's word to heart and dropped out of high school to try and develop the talent that he was born with to the fullest. We really can't argue with that logic. When a certain trade has been running through your family and you have a chance to make billions of dollars through that craft, it'd be worth it to take a chance, even if the odds are stacked against you. Floyd eventually took that chance. Even though Mayweather became one of the greatest boxers we've seen today, he wasn't born one of the greatest. He was known for his dedication to boxing. He still had to take a long road to get where he is today. His talent was spotted early on and developed as much as it could have. Talent alone won't cut it. Mayweather fans and haters can at least all agree on one thing. There's no denying his incessant, intense work ethic to become the best boxer. It was an obsession to be the best, and he was willing to do whatever it took. Mayweather was famous for his workouts that happened in the middle of the night. Mayweather may sometimes portray a party bachelor lifestyle, but he really was a machine that just got his workouts in whenever and wherever. He set a very high standard for himself to live up to. To him, it was probably easy because it was just what he wanted to do and what he was used to. Lucky for him, it was ridiculously hard for other boxers to be as dedicated. Even though it looked like he was partying hard, he actually wasn't. Mayweather doesn't drink alcohol. He watched what he ate. He didn't gain lots of weight in between fights like most other boxers do. There were times he would work out right after getting home from the club. He was willing to dedicate his entire life to boxing and outworking his competition. Mayweather didn't just work hard, he worked smart as well. He's a lifelong student of boxing. He was constantly tweaking, improving, and analyzing his techniques and strategies. His ability to continually adapt was a big reason why he was at the top of boxing for so long. Again, natural talent obviously was a big part of the equation in Mayweather's excellence, but to reduce his success to natural ability is to do a massive disservice to his work ethic. Talent is no different than an opportunity, and in Mayweather's case, it was an opportunity that he was consistently cultivating. Mayweather is a rational thinker. He created a strategy that was simple yet unbeatable. Don't get hit by your opponents and hit your opponents when you have a chance. Simple as that. He worked on his technique regularly to outthink, outmaneuver, and outbox his competition. Simply put, Floyd Mayweather has dedicated his life to the sport he chose. We all have to understand what we're up against. Mayweather's won fight after fight because he understood boxing better than anyone else. He studied and understood his opponents. There's no secret recipe to that other than experience. He put in countless hours of boxing. Mayweather figured out and implemented the perfect formula for success. He minimized his mistakes and maximized the opportunities his opponents had for mistakes. He used tactics very specific to his opponent's fighting style by knowing their weaknesses and exploiting them. He brought out the worst in his competitors and took advantage of it. All of this was simply taking the time to prepare. As Aristotle said, excellence is a continual habit and not a one-time event. The only way someone was going to beat Mayweather was to out-train him, out-think him, and out-endure him. It was gonna take someone who was born with greater talent and the willingness to have an abnormal life like Mayweather to be able to beat him. Taking punches was nothing new for Mayweather. He had been dealing with tough conditions his entire life. Floyd's dad wasn't there for him all the time. His mom had problems with different substances. The neighborhood he was around wasn't the greatest. Sometimes, it's a hidden blessing to have gone through struggle because you find out what you're made of and you know what you can handle in the future. People who are born with everything haven't been put to the test and it can be detrimental in the long run. They just don't know what it actually takes for success. Floyd Jr. talks of experiences of when he was about eight or nine when he was living in New Jersey with his mother. He said that at times they were living with up to seven people living in one bedroom and that there was often no electricity. Security and comfort were a couple of things that Floyd Mayweather had to literally fight for to get in life. Early exposure to violence and hardship are definitely not things that you need in order to be successful or even want. There are plenty of successful people who came from comfortable, conventional backgrounds. But more often than not, the most successful people who are self-made wouldn't trade the struggle they were put through. His difficult childhood almost definitely had a hand to play in making him one of the most determined, toughest boxers the world has ever seen.
Floyd often talks about a one day at a time type of philosophy. Floyd believed in taking everything a day at a time and just having relentless focus. Every day is a new day. Yesterday's work is irrelevant. All that mattered to him was that that day was another day of excellence. When it comes to punches connected, Floyd holds the record for being the most accurate puncher since the existence of CompuBox. He landed 42% of his punches thrown. The moral of the story is that efficiency wins. Floyd calculates every move, both in and out of the ring. A fighter might get a lucky break, throw a lucky punch, or use gimmicks or fancy tactics to win occasionally, but Floyd didn't want to count on luck. He counted on repeatable things. Greatness can only be achieved by mastering the fundamentals. In boxing, it's about two things, hitting and getting hit. Floyd excelled on both accounts, and the numbers didn't lie. Floyd developed his own style of training when it came to hitting the mitts. He found and developed what worked for him instead of blindly following conventions. His style of hitting the mitts was a complex practice of ducking and bobbing and endless punches and combinations. So Floyd did lots of fancy training combinations and made his mitt training into a sort of rhythmic dance. And so what? It was that exact point, understanding and adapting to what he needed. He didn't simply just repeat the same thing. Our competition is consistently changing. Mayweather understood that, and he was dynamic. He's always adapted to change in the environments he's operating in. Floyd has aspirations greater than boxing. He wants to make another billion dollars. This is obviously one big reason he's boxing Logan Paul. So who's on the money team? There are the MBAs, the photographers, and the businessmen. There are the massive bodyguards. There are Mayweather's family members. What they aren't are a bunch of people doing nothing for Mayweather. They all have a role on the team. His team isn't just for show. These are the people that help Mayweather run his business. And right now, they're allowing him to focus on his fight with Logan Paul. The vast majority of us will never need a big entourage such as Mayweather. But Mayweather keeps a tight team around him in order to help him efficiently run his life. He knows how important it is to allow the right people into his life. Mayweather has made his undefeated record an integral part of his personal brand, but the undefeated label is just the top layer of him being able to make large amounts of money. Floyd understands how to maximize his opportunities. He understands how the spotlight works. Mayweather is polarizing. People mostly either love him or hate him, but he planned it that way. He didn't care whether people love him or hate him. He just cares whether people will show up. When he was Pretty Boy Floyd, he was humble and likable, but not many people had a reason to watch his fights. He wasn't making anywhere close to what he was making later in his career. He knew he had to change his branding to make more money. As soon as he became the villain Money Mayweather, all of a sudden, everyone wanted to watch him lose, and he was absolutely fine with that. Mayweather fully understands that fans can be extremely passionate about wanting to see somebody they don't like to fail and struggle. He was one of the most hated boxers, and that was his own doing. He created the Money Mayweather persona exactly to rub people the wrong way. He knows that people will pay for the chance to watch him lose. His branding was done so well that it allowed him to put together a huge fight between him and someone who wasn't even in boxing. Conor McGregor was someone else who knew how important branding was. From a financial standpoint, there has never been a more successful boxer than Floyd Mayweather Jr. That has just as much to do with his negotiation tactics as it does with his skills and training. He broke all sorts of money records and generated tremendous attention for boxing. His business acumen and knowledge of how business works led him to the creation of Mayweather Promotions, allowing him full control of how he makes his money. By promoting and putting together his own fight, he's able to make a lot more money than the typical boxer. For the first 10 years of his professional career, Mayweather was a part of Bob Orem's stable of fighters at top-ranked promotions. During that time, he became the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world. Back in April of 2006, Mayweather turned down the highest purse for him at that time. He was offered $8 million to fight Antonio Margarito, but instead he decided to pay $750,000 to get out of his contract. He exercised an option in his contract that allowed him to become a free agent instead. That was a lot of money to pay for him at the time, but he bet on himself and it paid off massively. After buying himself out of his contract, Mayweather took unprecedented control over his career. Rather than getting paid a large guaranteed fee up front by a promoter, Mayweather puts it all together himself and bets on himself to be able to make more money than what a promoter would pay him. He earns a percentage of every ticket purchased and everything sold at the fight. He earns money from countries that pay for broadcasting rights. Basically, he's exchanging upfront risk for a back-end profit while retaining total control. This is exactly what an entrepreneur does in the hopes of getting a 
massive payday. And this is the reason why Mayweather's a billionaire today. He took control of the total revenue on the back end. Boxing and all other professional sports only exist because there's money to be made. And no one has made more money as a boxer than Mayweather. Here are some true stories about Bill Gates. Wait until you hear about what he loves doing to get arrested. Number 12, the real Bill Gates. Bill Gates and the late Paul Allen may forever be synonymous in the tech world, but that doesn't mean everything ran smoothly. They're credited as the creators of Microsoft, but there's a lot more to their relationship than just that. Supposedly, there's a whole other side to Bill Gates we just don't know. We've always heard Bill Gates' side of the story, but Paul Allen wanted to let the world know that he was the real idea man behind it all. In Allen's autobiography, Idea Man, he went on to explain how he was the person who came up with the idea for a piece of software that would create personal computers. That was the software BASIC, and it made personal computing user-friendly. But supposedly, Bill was against the idea because he felt that they would need more advanced hardware for that. According to Allen, it was also him, not Gates, who ultimately came up with the name Microsoft. But of course, it was Bill who made the name popular, making people believe the company's name was his idea. Paul Allen was excited to be the nerdy tech guy, and Bill was excited to be the business guy, so it was a good fit the way they worked together. But according to Paul Allen, there were a lot of not-so-positive sides of Bill, such as Bill was a sore loser in chess. He'd apparently get angry when he was losing and just knock all the pieces to the floor. The worst for Allen was the way Bill tried to maximize the money for himself. Allen claimed that Bill said it wouldn't be right for him to get half. Bill reasoned that because he did almost everything on BASIC, the split should be 60-40 in his favor. Gates then renegotiated the terms of their partnership to give himself 64-36. As the final insult, Allen overheard Bill discussing with Steve Ballmer how to dilute Allen's equity in the company. Gates was complaining that Allen was extremely unproductive and he shouldn't even be getting what he was getting. Well, Paul Allen had a very good reason though. He was missing a lot of work because he was fighting cancer at the time. For what it's worth, Bill Gates went to claim that Paul Allen's account doesn't match his own. Number 11. See? Cubed. What else did Paul Allen reveal in his book? We all know Bill Gates' sheer determination was one of the biggest reasons that determined Microsoft's success. Gates would work until his body would stop and he would crash on the carpet in the middle of his office. And this started at an early age. Allen revealed that during their work-filled weekends, they would find time to go to a dumpster. Why exactly? Well, in high school, Gates and Allen honed their programming skills on a mini computer owned by a local company, c -Cube. But as students, they didn't have access to as much information as the company's employees. That obviously frustrated them. So at night, Allen would help Gates step into the dumpster and start looking around for computer printouts that would help the company get information and a literal leg up. The idea was that if they were able to get some sort of indication of how earlier operating systems work, they would get clues on what they needed to work on to develop better technology. Back in those days, using the computer wasn't exactly free. They also had to pay for time to use the computer. As the charges mounted up for their computer time in high school, Gates and Allen began looking for a way to access one of the free accounts at C-Cube. They somehow got access to an administrator password and used it to steal the company's internal accounting file. They were hoping to decrypt the file to get access to one of the free accounts, but they eventually got caught. Number 10, license plate checks. Although Bill Gates is seen as an approachable tech billionaire, his employees probably tell a different story about a different Bill back in the day. What defines Bill's success is a relentless drive and fixation on making sure productivity levels remained high. He was known for pulling all-nighters all the time. He also didn't believe in time off on weekends or in vacations. During the first years of Microsoft, he resorted to what many people may consider unorthodox measures to make sure his employees were being as productive as they could be. He used to memorize his employees' license plates so he would know when people came to work. And this wasn't just on the weekdays. This was also on the weekends. This is definitely motivation to take public transportation or maybe ride a bike to work because would you want to be monitored by your boss like this? As if that weren't enough, after employees would put in long hours to finish a special project, Bill would just ask them to start another one immediately. Of course, his relentless drive wasn't met without resistance. Apparently, even some of the most passive employees would start pushing back, telling him that they weren't going to work insane hours. Also, he would have meetings with top managers just to make sure they were in control of their projects. Bill would ask harder and harder 
harder questions to his managers until they admitted that they didn't know, and then Bill would yell at them on purpose for being unprepared. These aren't exactly the best ways of being a leader, but what's undeniable is that Bill's drive and demanding personality were what ultimately pushed Microsoft to the top of the tech business for decades. Number nine, lawyer Bill? Being a notoriously smart boy from an early age, it came as no surprise that Bill Gates' trajectory was set up to be a highly successful one. Although he displayed a strong interest for computers and programming in his high school years, he didn't go straight into computers right away. His dad was William Henry Gates Sr., a prominent Seattle attorney. You can see why it would have been understandable that Bill's dad wanted Bill to have the same career path as his first option. His dad was a prominent member of Preston Gates and Ellis, one of America's largest law firms. Bill was accepted into Harvard Pre-Law, which is practically a guarantee for a successful career in the judicial system. Is there a Bill Gates arguing cases before the Supreme Court in another dimension? Obviously in this universe, Bill didn't find it to be quite like that. He couldn't help but run through Harvard's most challenging math and computer science courses. After two years, he put law and Harvard on pause altogether to work on his first software venture for MITS, an American electronics company that manufactured calculators and personal computers. Two years later, he finally dropped out with a clear aim on founding his long-desired software company. Number eight, Trafo Data. Did you think Microsoft was his first company? Nope, Bill has been a visionary from an early age. With this in mind, Gates co-founded Trafo Data with Paul Allen during the summer break right before Harvard. The idea was to basically find a way to read traffic data and then provide it to traffic engineers to interpret. Basically, they created a mini computer to track the flow of traffic. Although that sounds incredibly boring, it is very useful to cities wanting to know where to place new traffic signals or stop signs or make road repairs. Although the idea seemed to be quite useful for any city, it wasn't received with the resounding applause they had expected. They worked nonstop for two years and invested around $1,500. That was a lot of money at the time, especially for someone who just graduated from high school. However, Gates and Allen found that their product just wasn't anything people nor governments were interested in. After six years and almost 3,500 bucks later, it proved to be a failure. But although the company did not take off, the experience did give real contributions to Bill and Paul in the software programming skills they gained. Of course, they went on to create Microsoft right after Trafo Data's failure to launch. Number seven, strong like bull. For any entrepreneur, life's pretty rough in the beginning. Bill Gates wasn't a stranger to this reality. His work schedule was so demanding, he had virtually no time to even eat something. He says his incessant drive is what ultimately allowed him to achieve what he achieved. Bill has publicly acknowledged many of the tricks he would use back then to keep his workflow going without any type of distraction, food included. This meant working all day long and not worrying about whether or not he's had dinner. How did he get enough energy to work without food? Bill's secret to his almost never-ending source of energy? Dang. Yep, the famous orange instant drink that first came out in the late 50s in powdered form. If you don't remember, this was the same drink that astronauts would take with them on space missions back in the 60s. And that was Bill's power source during those long coding sessions. And he would spare himself the hassle of mixing it in water. This kind of reminds us of dolphins who would poke pufferfish just for their toxins. Find out more in this video right here. Apparently, he would go as far as just licking it off his hands. He made the argument that the human body already had plenty of water. He admitted that his face, hands, and keyboard would all be covered in orange dust. That's uh, something we definitely wouldn't do in this day and age. Number six, knighthood. Bill is known for how smart he is when it comes to technology, but did you know that he is also a knight? You probably already know that Bill is a big uh, philanthropist through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He and his wife have managed to donate billions of dollars to help make the world a better place. His contributions have been important for the development of third world countries that have to deal with many problems we don't face anymore. One very special person took interest in what he was doing, Queen Elizabeth. Through the United Kingdom's foreign office, the Queen decided to award Gates with an honorary title not many people have had the pleasure to receive, the Knight Commander of the Order of the British Empire. This is a title awarded to citizens that are believed to provide great contributions to the British people. You're probably saying, but wait, Bill Gates is American. Well, that's true, but Microsoft has operating offices in the UK and it directly employs almost 3,000 people in England. Queen Elizabeth has said that she's not too big into typing on computers, 
but she does somewhat still embrace technology. She sent her first email way back in 1976, with some help, of course. However, she was way late to Instagram. Her first post was only back in March of 2019. Although Bill is now a knight of the British crown, he's actually not allowed to be called Sir, since this is only reserved for actual British citizens. Number five, worst game ever. Did you know Bill Gates wrote the first game ever made for a personal computer? In 1980, he was able to convince tech giant IBM that Microsoft had the best operating software for IBM's new personal computer. Well, the problem was, Bill lied. Microsoft didn't have any operating system in development at the time. So what did he do? He bought an operating system from a small startup and just repackaged it to IBM for $430,000. As part of the deal though, IBM wanted the operating system to come with a programming language for beginners called BASIC, along with a few games to show off how it worked. After long hours of brainstorming and coding, Gates and Neil Konzen came up with a very simple game called Donkey Dot Base. It was a very simple driving game. So simple to the point that you can't steer, brake, or accelerate. All you can do is just avoid donkeys by pressing the space bar. The player basically drives in order to avoid donkeys. Does the logic even make sense? Their competitor, Apple, bought an IBM PC in 1981 in order to dissect and spy on Microsoft's work. Once they got a hold of the donkey game, they didn't hold back on the review. Apple employee Andy Hertzfeld reported to Steve Jobs that the graphics of the game were extremely bad, along with the entire concept of the game. He was amazed at the fact that, with how bad the game was made, why Bill Gates even bothered to write that he was a co-author of the game within the game itself. Number four, class games. Bill Gates is easily one of the most notorious college dropouts in the US. But there's a little secret Bill Gates had to keep to himself for years. Not only did he just drop out of Harvard, but he also didn't actually attend any of his classes. However, that doesn't mean that he never went to class because he did. He just never went to his scheduled classes. He basically made up a little game for himself just to make things fun. The classes that he actually signed up for, he never went to class. He just took the exams. And for classes he did not sign up for, he always went to class. Is it any surprise that he managed to score A's in most of the classes he registered for? And of course, Gates being who he is, was consistently among the most vocal students at the class he wasn't supposed to be at. How did he get mostly A's? He would just study extra hard during Harvard's reading period, the extra time when students would prepare for their exams. Bill revealed his secret during a Ask Me Anything session he did on Reddit. People were able to ask him all sorts of questions regarding his life, business, and early years. When he was asked what his fondest memory was at Harvard, that's when he went on and spilled the beans on his secret of playing his own little game that he made. Although Gates has proved he's one of the most successful people in the world, he's still human. He wasn't able to get an A in organic chemistry. He had to settle for a C+. Number three, office romance. Major corporations tend to have policies on disclosing romantic relationships, and any relationship between direct supervisors and a subordinate is almost always strictly prohibited. But despite the risks, office romances do happen. Bill and his wife Melinda were not an exception. Melinda Gates, formerly Melinda French, was working as a product marketing manager at Microsoft. They met in 1987, four months into her job at Microsoft, when they sat next to each other at a work dinner in New York. It seems like they didn't quite hit it off right away because they both went their separate ways that same night. A few months later, they reconnected when they bumped into each other at the Microsoft parking lot. Bill asked her to go on a date with him, except his problem was that he asked her to go out a whopping two weeks later. Melinda basically told him he wasn't spontaneous enough for her and said no. An hour later, Bill called her asking if this move was spontaneous enough and they went out for dinner. This is how they started a very discreet romance that went on for a couple of years. Long story short, in 1994, they got married in Hawaii. Number two, class schedules. Who knew Bill always had a thing for the ladies? Back in 1967, Bill was still in high school and met Paul Allen. They became a known pair because of their shared interest in computers. Once their school knew of their ability to do coding, they started to give them some work, but Bill saw an opportunity and took it. They hacked into the school's computers and scheduled Bill in classes that were supposed to be all girls. Unfortunately for Paul Allen, he was two years ahead of Bill, and he was already off to college by then. Although it was a fantastic idea, Gates has publicly acknowledged that he wasn't able to take advantage. 
He apparently just wasn't social enough back then, and that was something he would carry with him to Harvard to his regret. Number one, Leadfoot. Surprise, surprise, Bill Gates actually has been arrested before, and not just once, but he's actually been arrested twice, although it wasn't for anything major. The first time happened back in 1975 when he allegedly ran a stop sign in his hometown of Medina, Washington. Gates was then pulled over by a cop who had been sitting right in front of the sign out of sight. Several reports say Gates started acting verbally aggressive, and that's when the cop decided to arrest him. Bill was arrested again in 1977 for reckless driving. It happened in New Mexico where he was pulled over for speeding, running a stop sign, and driving without a license. However, all these stories haven't been exactly confirmed by Bill Gates himself, so some of the details are probably a little fuzzy. But the mugshot is real. In 2008, Gates appeared in a Microsoft ad with Jerry Seinfeld where Jerry runs into Bill at a fake shoe store called Shoe Circus. At one point in the commercial, Bill shows the salesperson his membership card for Shoe Circus. And Bill used his mugshot as the photo on his membership card. In no particular order, here are a few of the most successful people who started from the bottom. Wait until you hear how much credit card debt the founder of Under Armour took on to start the company. Number 9. Du Wong Don Chan the founding father of Forever 21 wasn't always rich. In 1981, Don and his wife Jin Suk emigrated from South Korea to Los Angeles to pursue the American dream. When they got to the US, they were pretty much broke. Don worked as a janitor, pumped gas, and worked in a coffee shop to make ends meet. One day he realized that all the wealthy people he encountered worked in fashion. So he decided that he would get into fashion too. In 1984, he and Jin Suk opened up a 900 square foot store in LA named Fashion 21. They had over $700,000 in sales in the first year. They decided to reinvest the money and open a new store in different locations every six months. Today, Forever 21 remains a family business. The stores bring in roughly $4.4 billion in sales and the Changs have an estimated net worth of $6.1 billion. Do us a quick favor and hit that like button right down there. Number eight, Kevin Plank. Kevin Plank is the founder and CEO of Under Armour. However, it wasn't all that long ago that he was the average college football player who didn't go pro. After college, he was worried about what his next move was going to be. While he was in college, he had made $20,000 by selling t-shirts at concerts. However, he had bigger plans in mind. He wanted to solve the problem of heavy, sweat-soaked shirts athletes had to deal with. So, in the summer of 1997, Plank started Under Armour in a DC row house. Taking a leap of faith, Plank decided to take on over $40,000 in credit card debt. Plank's risk paid off when he made his first sale to Georgia Tech for about $17,000. After that first sale, two dozen NFL teams wanted his shirts too. At the end of his second year, he had sold $100,000 worth of products, and the rest is history. Today, with a net worth of over $2 billion, Plank is one of the living proofs of a self-made billionaire. If you're enjoying this video, make sure to click the subscribe button and also the notification bell. Number 7. Jim Carrey Jim Carrey has always been very open about his struggle with dyslexia and depression, and that's just the tip of what he had to deal with growing up. His family lived out of a yellow camper when he was around 14 because his dad lost his job. He dropped out of high school as an early teenager because everyone in his family had to get jobs. Carrey worked as a janitor for two years, but it was kind of a blessing in disguise. There wasn't much for Carrey to do after work except work on his comedy act. And it was in a time like this that his creativity was born. However, despite opening for comedian Rodney Dangerfield in the early 80s, Carey didn't hit it big until the mid-90s. Interestingly enough, in 1992, he wrote himself a check for $10 million and dated it three years in advance for services rendered. This served him as a reminder to work hard. After over a decade of working in comedy clubs and being on television sporadically, Carey finally hit it big. He landed his first box office hit with Ace Ventura Bet Detective back in 1994. And he finally got his first $10 million check for his role in his third big hit, Dumb and Dumber. And the year? Three years after he wrote himself the check in 1995. Number 6. Jay-Z 
Sean Carter, or Jay-Z as we all know him by, recently became the first billionaire rapper. For a guy like him who was born and raised in the Marcy Projects, this is nothing short of amazing. His father left the family when he was 12 years old. This led to 11 years of peddling, let's just call it, illegal things. That's until he decided that he was meant for so much more and that he wanted out of that game. He went to the same high school as Notorious B.I.G. and Busta Rhymes. Busta has said that the reason he rapped so fast was because of losing a battle between him and Jay in high school. Just like a lot of other rappers, Jay spent a lot of his early career selling his own CDs out of the trunk of his car. Jay, Damon Dash, and Kareem Burke created Rockefeller Records. They also created the clothing line Rockaway, which they sold for $204 million. Jay has also gone on to have numerous other successful business ventures, such as Rock Nation Sports and the 4040 Club. And, oh yeah, did we mention Jay has gone on to sell over 36 million records? Number 5. J.K. Rowling J.K. Rowling created a whole new world for an entire generation, all at the same time while her own reality wasn't the best. If she could have simply avada cadavered her troubles away, we probably would not have the Harry Potter series today. She left behind a difficult marriage in Argentina and made Scotland her home. But she had two of the most important things with her, her infant daughter and the first three chapters of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Still, this was a point in her life where Rowling considered herself a failure. She described her economic status as being poor as possible without actually being homeless. Despite her situation, she managed to complete the first ever manuscript for Harry Potter in 1995. However, that didn't mean success came quickly. Twelve different publishers rejected her book. But finally, in 1997, it happened. Bloomsbury, a publishing house in London, gave Harry Potter the green light. That one chance is all it took for her to move on from a life of poverty to being worth nearly one billion dollars today. The only reason she's not a billionaire? She lost her billionaire status by giving away millions of dollars charity. Number 4. Kevin Hart Kevin Hart came from humble beginnings. He grew up poor and was raised in a single parent household. He recalls how he slept in a bunk bed in the hallway growing up. His dad missed a lot of his childhood. He was in and out of jail and caused a lot of trouble within the family. Kevin first tried the conventional college route, but he eventually dropped out and got regular jobs at sneaker stores to help his mom with bills. However, his instincts told him to follow his dream, so he decided to go after stand-up comedy. When he first started as a comic, he was constantly booed off stage. His mom had agreed to pay his rent for a year as he worked to get noticed, but things didn't pick up quickly for him. From cancelled pilots to cancelled comedy slots, he was used to rejection. He almost decided to give it all up, but Hart never gave up. It took years of doing comedy clubs and appearing in many small movie roles until his career started blowing up. Kevin Hart became a huge success despite all the setbacks. He was finally able to beat the odds to make it where he is today. Now he easily commands over $10 million a movie. To this day, he still works as hard as he did back before he made his millions. Number 3. Guy Laberté If you love Cirque du Soleil, then you have Guy Laberté to thank. This space-traveling circus CEO started out as a street performer. He became inspired to become a performer after his parents took him to watch the Ringling Brothers. So, at the age of 18, he left Canada to hitchhike and perform across Europe. He earned money playing his accordion and met street performers who taught him the arts of fire-eating and stilt-walking. And that's how he met his future business partners who shared his aspirations to create Cirque du Soleil. It took a few years, but eventually the circus was a moderate success in Europe. In 1995, Cirque began touring North America. The success of the company grew rapidly, and by the early 90s, Cirque du Soleil was a hit in Asia as well. The company was offered a permanent residence at Treasure Island in Las Vegas in 1993. That first show was Mystere, a show that's still running to this day. And the reason why Liberté is so rich today? They negotiated to retain all creative control and ownership of all the performances. Today, he still owns 80% of the company and is easily worth over a billion dollars. How many street performers go from earning a few dollars a day to becoming a billionaire? Number 2. Ed Sheeran Ed Sheeran wasn't always the confident performer we know him to be today. Way before you heard his songs on the radio, he struggled as a musician and as an adolescent. Ed was bullied in school after a botched surgery that left him with a lazy eye. The color of his hair wasn't any help either. Neither was his stutter or oversized glasses. 
However, it all changed one day. He had discovered Eminem and was fascinated at how fast Eminem could rap. With enough practice rapping to Marshall Mathers' LP, he soon was able to rap as fast as Eminem. And his stutter also went away. He started performing wherever he could. He played on the streets and anywhere he was paid in meals. He talked about how he often had to sleep in many different places. Usually it was a friend's couch, but he'd even sleep in a park after playing a show. Some nights he was without money or food. However, contrary to popular belief, he was never homeless. Today, his net worth is estimated at over 100 million, and he's one of the most famous musicians in the world. Number one. John Paul DeJoria. You've heard of Patron Tequila, right? Or what about Paul Mitchell products? Those products are the brainchild of John Paul DeJoria. He's a billionaire and philanthropist who was raised in a single parent household. His first gig was selling Christmas cards door to door along with a paper route. And this was at the age of nine. Because his family was poor, college was not an option, so he joined the Navy instead. And that wasn't the best option for him either. Over the next few years, he worked numerous odd jobs, none of which lasted long enough. However, things began to change for him in 1980. Even though he was living out of his car, he managed to get a loan of $700 to start John Paul Mitchell Systems. With co-founder Paul Mitchell, they began a company that generates over a billion dollars in revenue per year today. In 1989, he also co-founded another mega business hit, Patron Tequila. Fast forward to 2018, and his company sold off Patron to Bacardi for $5.1 billion. Today, his net worth is well over $3 billion and growing. Here are some of the best habits of the most successful people. Number nine, Richard Branson. To many people, exercise is an essential. Being active almost every day of the week is a ritual for gym rats out there. The release of endorphins is truly beneficial for anyone trying to improve their quality of work and quality of life in general. This is especially true if you're a billionaire with a bunch of businesses to run. Richard Branson, founder of the Virgin Group, is popularly known for his vivacious personality and also being a little bit of a daredevil. But that didn't happen just by chance. Branson has rigorous morning rituals that have helped him become the successful person he is today. One of them being his daily morning workout. This British mogul swears by it, claiming that the secret to his productivity is a good amount of exercise as part of his morning routine. Not only does exercise create healthier habits, but it also allows your body to get a boost of necessary energy. And let's not forget that regular exercise improves your mental capacity by improving your memory and creativity. And because we're talking about Richard Branson, you couldn't expect anything less than a morning session of kite surfing, tennis, or swimming. Coming from a man known for his creative and sometimes risky ideas, exercising is a habit we can learn from Branson, and of course, many other gym rats, that we should all be putting into practice. Number eight, Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, you guys didn't think old Ben Franklin would be on this list, would you? But we can learn a lot from the guy who's the face of the $100 bill. Being a founding father of the United States of America was not an easy job. It required a lot of knowledge and determination and also waking up early. Regarded as one of the most respected great thinkers of his time, Benjamin Franklin developed an obsession for planning ahead. According to many sources, the inventor of bifocal glasses was a meticulous planner. Not only did he wake up early, but he made sure he would start his day with lots of tasks so he would have a busy day ahead. His day started at 4 a.m., which seems to have become the standard time many CEOs wake up now. And from then, he would create a detailed plan of what he would do. Specificity is the key here. Franklin would set precise goals to achieve during the day, which is something modern experts have concluded is incredibly beneficial for anyone's productivity. The list of inventions and accolades Ben Franklin received during his life are more than a confirmation that this little habit was really effective. Number seven, Steve Jobs. Carpe diem is a popular phrase that's been used to inspire people to make the most of their time. But how many of us really make each day count? If there were ever a person that can talk the talk and walk the walk, it's definitely Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was known for his driven character, a trait that sometimes didn't make him many friends. But did you know his determined attitude originated from a very particular morning ritual? He would look at himself in the mirror and ask if he was happy with what he was doing. He contemplated whether or not his life would have been worth it if he died that day. A simple yet introspective question that, according to many people, changed his attitude daily. Not only did this make him change his actions, but it created a mindset that allowed him to be as great as he could be. 
Considering the struggles he went through with his businesses and all the success Apple was able to achieve after Steve Jobs became CEO, it seems that this little pep talk turned out to be quite effective. Number six, Jeff Bezos. Have any of you guys ever heard of the two pizza rule? Well, this rule isn't literally about pizza, but to be honest, any time a rule strictly involving pizza is cool in my book. Anyways, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos has built a modern day empire based on his ability to take calculated risks that translated into not only profits, but respect from his employees. One of the things he firmly believes in is not wasting time. And he believes the most meetings are unnecessary. Jeff Bezos was a very particular kind of habit he's been practicing whenever he isn't able to avoid a meeting. If a meeting is necessary, he developed what he's called the two pizza rule. This rule essentially states that the number of people in attendance should be enough to be fed by only two pizzas. Jeff Bezos believes that if there are too many people in a meeting, the meeting becomes boring and unproductive. Many people apparently have backed Bezos' belief saying that a reduced number of participants is likely to increase productivity during a meeting. Bezos also makes sure that everyone knows exactly the main points that will be discussed in the meeting to keep the meeting efficient and everyone on point. Number five, Elon Musk. Consistent improvement has never hurt anyone. And this is especially true if you currently manage some of the most cutting edge business ventures in the world. Elon Musk is one of the smartest entrepreneurs in the world, and he's somehow able to implement most, if not all, of his daring ideas through efficiency and time management. First of all, he's a firm believer in schedules. His schedule is supposedly broken down into five-minute slots. That's a little bit insane to me, but hey, whatever works. Second of all, he's really into email. He prides himself on getting things done via email, and it's the most important communication tool for him. However, what's the one habit that really helps him with his creativity? Well, it seems that there's one little question that's consistently challenging him. Elon Musk is constantly asking himself, what can I improve to be better? This small question has an enormous impact on his mindset, allowing him to always be open for change and search for alternatives. This is something that we can all be asking ourselves, and even the smallest improvements can make a difference. While we may not all be starting electric car companies, but Improving our personal efficiency is exactly what would make the biggest impact in our own lives. Number four, Tony Shea. Tony Shea is the founder of Zappos, one of the leading e-commerce platforms for shoes and apparel. However, to his employees, he's known as someone who likes to think outside the box. He's the creator of numerous interesting initiatives at Zappos. For example, he started a no title kind of management, in which all managers and titles were eliminated. He wanted to create an equal ground for all collaborators to participate in something known as a holacracy. However, he's still as busy and efficient as any other CEO. When it comes to emails, it's of course never ending for him, a feeling that a lot of us can probably relate to. Shea came up with an email system called Yesterbox in 2012 when he felt his emails getting out of control. One of the biggest reasons? As soon as he replied to an email, he'd just get an immediate response to the email he just sent. So in order to limit the amount of emails he gets each day, Shea only deals with yesterday's emails. Shea first replies to 10 emails from the day before, before looking at any new emails from that day. After he's processed 10 emails, meaning that he's removed them from yesterday's inbox, either by replying, filing, deleting, or setting up an appointment to reply to emails he knows that's going to take a long time, then his reward is getting to read the new emails that have come in. Shea set up this system because he felt his inbox was a never-ending treadmill. A lot of his important emails would actually end up never getting replies because he would just end up procrastinating. With this system, he's forcing himself to deal with those emails that he doesn't want to reply to, and he sets himself a limit on the emails that he's willing to deal with that day. Number three, Naval Ravikant. Being successful in business and making millions of dollars isn't the secret to happiness. According to Naval Ravikant, he co-founded AngelList, a website where investors, founders, and people looking to work in startups meet. AngelList has allowed Naval Ravikant to invest in many successful companies such as Uber and LinkedIn. However, when it comes to happiness, Naval's found that attaining a lot of the typical definitions of success didn't contribute much to his happiness. Naval says the most important trick to be happy is to realize that happiness is a skill that you develop and a choice that you make. You have to work at it just like building muscles or losing weight. You decide it's important to you, and you have to prioritize it about everything else. He actually thinks that what we think of happiness is just pleasure. According to Navel, true happiness comes out of peace. Peace comes out of many things, but it comes from fundamentally understanding yourself. 
It comes from looking inside yourself and seeing how much of what you're reacting to are emotional reactions or attachments. Essentially, self-inflicted suffering, where it's a desire for things that we probably shouldn't care that much about. Neville goes on to say that the modern world is full of distractions. Things like Twitter and Facebook are not making people happy. People are essentially playing a game that's created by the creators of those systems, and it's only a useful game once in a blue moon. Most people are just engaged in dispute, resentment, comparison, jealousy, and anger about things that, frankly, just don't matter. And to be honest, I can't disagree with Navalon much. I 100% agree that we can decide the thoughts that go on in our head that ultimately affect how we feel. Number two, Warren Buffett. Some successful businessmen serve as an example that we all need to have an interesting personality. As rich as he is, Warren Buffett has found time within his busy schedule to have a hobby or two. One of them being the ukulele. Named the second richest person in the world in 2017 by Forbes, Buffett has managed to build his fortune by investing in companies he obviously felt were the best bets. But he also makes sure he has time off to work on his hobby of playing the ukulele. Buffett has said that the advantages of playing the ukulele are numerous. It sparked his creativity and allowed him to unwind from the relentless pace of the business world. Buffett firmly believes that having a hobby that you get to practice outside of your work life creates balance. Having a hobby is therapeutic and almost meditative because devoting time to that hobby provides creative solutions to everyday problems as Warren Buffett can test. Making sure to have time for yourself always allows your brain to relax. As for Warren Buffett, it's probably also quite the handy party trick in addition to being his outlet for relaxation. Number one, Bill Gates reads 50 books a year. Finding the time to read seems to be the most common thread of highly successful people. And Bill Gates is no exception to this rule. Gates has been a voracious reader since he was young. He said that he's read a book a week from an early age. Although his free time has gotten less and less throughout his life, that hadn't stopped his desire to learn as he still reads around 50 books a year. Gates says he makes time for it, even in his busiest weeks. Most of what he reads is nonfiction that explains something about how the world works. Much research has shown that people who read a lot often have a lower decline in memory versus those who don't. Reading is still the main way that Bill Gates learns new things and tests his understanding of a topic. As he says, reading still seems to be the best way to learn about any topic. With pretty much anything we want to learn has been put in print, I'm not going to argue against reading to learn as much as possible. Eight Life Lessons to Learn from Conor McGregor Number 8. Bet on Yourself Having a healthy dose of self-confidence in yourself is one of the key things you need to do if you want to achieve whatever goals you have set out for yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, who will? Conor McGregor isn't short on it when it comes to confidence. In his UFC 189 matchup against Chad Mendez, McGregor was pretty confident in his skills, or better said, confident enough to the tune of $3 million. According to UFC President Dana White, McGregor wanted to make a bet with him and a co-owner of the UFC. Connor offered to put down $3 million that he would finish Mendes early. Even White himself said that he couldn't believe how confident McGregor is of his abilities. Of course, as much as White likes to gamble, the bet wasn't accepted as fighters betting with promoters is a big no-no. Still, White says McGregor's willingness to do such a thing goes to show the world just how much confidence he carries around. While betting with your bosses on a fight is probably a bit unprofessional, there's no doubt McGregor was dead serious about his prediction. The event brought in $7.2 million at the gate, which broke the record at the time for an MMA event in the US. And yeah, for anyone wondering, McGregor did incredibly win the second round, meaning that he would have actually won the money had the bet actually happened. The best bet you can make in life is always on yourself, because ultimately it's up to you whether or not you succeed. Number 7. Hard Work, Not Talent According to Conor McGregor himself, talent doesn't exist. Everything is predicted on hard work. McGregor has stated on more than one occasion that he's not even remotely talented at what he does, and that his success is because he's completely obsessed with his craft, and he's where he's at because he was willing to do whatever it took. The Irish-born featherweight doesn't keep a schedule in a traditional sense, 
In fact, he hates routines and just trains whenever he feels like it. Most of the time, he simply wakes up and starts training. For Conor McGregor, mixed martial arts training starts and ends with control, so all of McGregor's movements revolve around control of his body, mind, and breath. On a typical day, McGregor goes to the gym and does a bunch of different exercises that don't just involve fighting. For example, he might do a few rounds of jiu-jitsu, do some pad work, jump some rope, and do core work. McGregor also does free weight exercises, such as single leg barbell deadlifts to build strength and balance simultaneously. However, he stated that his best asset is his belief in himself, and the fact that he has a stronger mindset than that of his opponents. McGregor and Mayweather go head to head in one of the most anticipated boxing matches in history on August 26, 2017. McGregor has been doing his intense training camp at the most technically advanced center he can get to. McGregor released a series of pictures on his official Instagram, working hard at the UFC's Performance Institute in Las Vegas. There are snaps of him sparring in the ring, recovering in a negative 278 degree cryotherapy chamber and running in an underwater treadmill. Can McGregor actually shock the world? Can he actually cram and ace this intense exam with one of the best boxers ever? Vote and let me know. Can't wait to see how that fight turns out in the end. Number 6. Win the Psychological War Psychological warfare has been around since the dawn of time, and it's one of the oldest weapons, not to mention one of the most effective weapons in warfare. Most wars are won before it even begins. The main goal is to demoralize and break the enemy's will to fight. In case you guys didn't know, McGregor is a master of psychological warfare. McGregor always engages in trash talk against his opponents, which has led to comparisons of him to Muhammad Ali, whom McGregor cites as one of his early inspirations. One example of McGregor playing some tricky games was when he verbally destroyed Chad Mendez before the fight in interviews. Mendez said that during their fight, McGregor didn't stop trash talking the entire time as well. Mendez would hit him with everything he had, and Connor would say, is that all you got? Many of McGregor's opponents don't even engage him in any type of trash talk because they don't have as much practice in the psychological warfare as McGregor does. Another great story is McGregor's fight with Dustin Poirier, the fight which propelled Conor McGregor to stardom in the UFC. Poirier himself spoke about his fight with Conor McGregor and how the mind games really affected him in the build-up to the fight. He said that the moment that messed with his head was when he was getting ready to walk out and saw McGregor smiling and pointing at him. The guy he was supposed to fight was just standing there smiling at him, showing no fear whatsoever. Number 5. Create a Spectacle Apart from being one of the best fighters in the world, McGregor knows exactly how to turn heads, and he's definitely not afraid to use his Instagram to create a full-blown spectacle because what's the use of being one of the best fighters in the world if no one knows who you are and have no interest in seeing you win or lose? Fans can catch McGregor posting pictures of himself on Instagram, doing everything from training in a gym, wearing a perfectly fitted three-piece suit, or hanging with the latest celeb. Oh yeah, let's also not forget all the photos of the supercars he's been whipping around. Basically, if he's not fighting, he's as flashy as he can be and that can only be good for business. Back in April 2014, he was named Most Stylish Man at the VIP Style Magazine Awards in Ireland. McGregor has said before that he really enjoys doing two things, whooping ass and looking good. Although being as flashy as possible works for McGregor in his profession, that obviously doesn't mean it works for most people. What does work is for people to make themselves known for what they do best, whether it's personal or professional. Probably one of the best moments ever in the history of press conferences happened thanks to McGregor, 
when he casually combined the worlds of high fashion and trash talking in a way only he could do. During one of the press conferences for McGregor's fight with Floyd Mayweather, McGregor made a huge splash with the suit that he was wearing. He told the cameras to zoom in and get a closer look because the suit says F you. He wasn't kidding in the slightest because when the cameras did zoom in, each stripe, sure enough, was made up of dozens of little f yous up and down the suit. Clearly, it was a brilliant message meant for Mayweather and anyone else who was close enough to read it. Number 4. Visualize Your Goals It's no secret that hard work made Conor McGregor a world champion in just a few years. However, apart from all the hard work he put into his career, McGregor visualizes his goals before executing them. He said that if you're able to clearly focus on the goals you want in your head and say those exact same things out loud, then your goals will happen. You'll be nothing less than motivated to execute what you want. According to McGregor, creating the energy of what you want to experience is just as important as speaking out loud about the things you want. Your thoughts are everything. What you think is what you become. For McGregor, that once meant saying things such as, I am the champion, I am the best in the world, out loud to himself. Of course, McGregor is now one of the world's best and is an actual champion. But he has had the heart of a champion before he actually was one in the first place. We can learn from McGregor to behave and act as if you've already achieved your goal, no matter where you are. Success begins first and foremost with our mindset. What's actually pretty amazing and weird at the same time is how many times McGregor has predicted the way his fights are going to end. McGregor has been labeled as Mystic Mac due to his uncanny ability to gaze into his so-called crystal ball and predict the future. When he was fighting Jose Aldo, McGregor knew he was going to win right from the start. Before the opening of the first round, Aldo and McGregor refused to touch gloves. They went immediately into combat, and it ended with Aldo losing consciousness in mere seconds, 13 seconds to be exact. The knockout was the fastest finish in UFC title fight history. Number 3. Be loyal to those loyal to you McGregor believes in a lot about loyalty. He's tweeted out the fact that loyalty is everything. McGregor has stayed with the same team for years and, so far, refused to leave Ireland and move to the US. In true Irish McGregor fashion, even his walkout music is a tribute to his home country. His music features Sinead O'Connor, who's a famous Irish singer and songwriter. Apart from showing massive love for his fans and working with the same people, he stated there's one person in particular who keeps him going his girlfriend and mother of his son, Dee Devlin. McGregor and the 28-year-old Devlin have been together long before his UFC stardom. The fighter admitted he's incredibly thankful to his longtime girlfriend for sticking by him through thick and thin, especially in times when he had absolutely nothing. In fact, in order to support Connor on the road, Dee quit her job to be able to travel more. They've been together since 2008, and he hired her as an official member of his team, where she currently manages his finances. Their first child, Connor Jack McGregor Jr., was born on the 5th of May, 2017. Number 2. Don't let your past define you. Connor McGregor was raised in a small town called Crumlin in the suburbs of South Dublin, and this is where he learned his craft as an MMA fighter in the early days. He used to get bullied because of him being an easy target because of his shorter and smaller stature and size growing up. Bullying is one reason why he grew up closer to combat sports growing up. Although later on, things still didn't look that promising for those that didn't know him. Conor McGregor had a job as a plumber and just before his first high profile fight in UFC, he picked up a $180 welfare check because he had to make ends meet. In February 2007, at the age of 18, McGregor made his MMA debut in an amateur fight against Kieran Campbell in Dublin, 
where he was victorious via TKO in the first round. Following the fight, he turned professional and was signed by the Irish Cage of Truth promotion. Even though he came from humble beginnings, McGregor didn't let any of his hardships define who he was. He's completely reinvented his life and established himself as the biggest pay-per-view draw in MMA history. Number 1. Never Give Up If there's one thing where McGregor really excels at, it's definitely his persistence. He never, ever gives up, even when he's going through the most difficult moments in life, as he's demonstrated before. In fact, during a fight against Max Holloway, McGregor ended up tearing his ACL and still ended up winning the fight. During the round, McGregor heard and felt a huge pop in his leg, but decided to keep going. He realized he was very wobbly on it, but decided to go on because he felt he could still win the fight. Of course, it did affect the way McGregor fought, as his win came from a decision and not from a KO, like McGregor normally delivers. During the post-fight interview, McGregor admitted that it still felt like a loss to him since he wasn't able to deliver a more glorious finish. Just like when things didn't look like it was the greatest when he was a plumber on welfare, McGregor fought on because he believed in himself and believed in his vision. Here are a few people who became rich overnight. Number 8. Kevin Lewis how often do people go into a casino and really beat the house? In this case, one guy did beat the house, although it was completely by luck, and the casino decided to play nice anyways. Horseshoe Casino of Cincinnati, Ohio accidentally gave a million each to two distinct Cincinnati locals named Kevin Lewis, after it let the wrong Kevin Lewis to first collect the prize. However, obviously a different guy named Kevin Lewis won the prize. Horseshoe Casino actually owned up to its mistake and let the super lucky Kevin Lewis collect on the prize. While rep for the casino declined to provide specifics on the two-step verification process the contest employs, they did say one of the things that threw them off was the fact that the second Kevin Lewis was around the same age. Also, the Kevin Lewis that actually won wasn't in the casino when his name was called. There were several other similarities between the two Kevins that led to the confusion. Of course, the real Kevin Lewis, who was supposed to win the prize, was paid as well. In an interesting follow-up, the Kevin Lewis that wasn't supposed to win the money spent all of the money within a year somehow, and was actually eventually arrested on drug charges. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, do us a favor and hit that like button for us. On to the next millionaire. Number 7. Sandy Stein Sandy Stein is another hard-working person who had an idea and decided to turn her idea into reality. Stein had worked for 35 years as a flight attendant, but after going after her idea, she's now in a completely different profession with her invention Finders Keepers. She came up with the idea because she was consistently having trouble finding her keys at the bottom of her purse. So she came up with essentially a decorative key holder that hangs on the side of purses so keys can be found easily. Her idea was so popular that she was able to sell 1 million of these key finders in her first year. Her company has had over $40 million in sales over 11 years, a figure that's not too shabby for such a simple idea. Since she's gotten rich, Stein says that she travels a lot, but her dumbest purchase was paying full price cash for a Lexus without even negotiating. As for the smartest thing she's invested in, a team of lawyers whose sole purpose is to protect her patent from any copycats out there. Can't disagree with that one. Number 6. Oscar and Lorraine Stoller Finding oil on your property and making you a multi-millionaire is a pipe dream that's more from the past than right now. However, apparently that dream can still happen. That's essentially what happened to Oscar and Lorraine Stoller, who were 83 and 82 years old at the time. Oscar was raised on that property in North Dakota and ranched there for nearly seven decades. Obviously, he never gave much thought to what was beneath the ground. When oil men wanted to drill on his property back in 2008, Stoller, of course, doubted that oil would be found two miles on the ground on his property. He even joked that he would buy a Cadillac convertible and put big horns on it. Well, they did find oil on their property, 
and in less than a year, Oscar and Laureen became millionaires from the well. The wealth wasn't long lived, as Oscar passed away shortly after. However, the couple was able to enjoy the wealth a little bit by buying a new home, paid in cash of course. They also established trust accounts for their four children. Laureen said that the only splurge was an automatic sprinkler system for her flowers that surround the couple's new home. And Oscar bought a $1,000 ring for his wife to celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. Number 5. Marv Doniger Whenever you get cancer, it's devastating news. However, when you find out that you've had cancer for years because your full-time medical doctor neglected to analyze your disease, it's much, much worse. This is essentially the story of Marv Doniger, a management consultant by profession. Doniger had to get his bladder removed and he wasn't able to walk for quite a while. However, he was able to collect $3.3 million after successfully suing in court. After getting his windfall, Doniger didn't make any splashy purchases. He only bought two poodles and a car. He also set up trust funds for his grandchildren. Doniger said that anyone that's presented with a sudden lump of cash is left with a set of choices. You can use it to satisfy near-term desires or use it to ensure your financial future. He said to develop a strategy for dealing with those rainy days that are definitely going to come. That and to be aware of those people who present you with investment ideas you don't understand and don't need to achieve your financial goals. Hey, I don't think I can disagree with any of those statements. Number 4. David Gell Any of you guys out there join an office pool for a lottery? Yes? Same here for us at Pablito's Way. This is exactly how David Gell won his millions, in a pool for a lottery with his co-workers. We've always thought it to be tough to actually get the money split right in these situations, but apparently it can be done. Together with seven of his co-workers at ConAgra Foods, Gale won a share of $365 million in the lottery in 2006. His share after taxes, about $15 million. That's a lot smaller number than $365 million, but in any case for David Gale, it's still a big win. Dave apparently has been living happily ever after. Some portion of Gale's happy ending has included outings to Vietnam with another co-worker who had won. He's been trying to stay out of the spotlight, and apparently he frequently turns down interviews. After his win, his life didn't change much. He still lives a normal life. He shovels snow for his neighbors in the winter. For a while after he won, he stayed at his job at Conagra, but he finally quit. He's claimed to haven't bought anything dumb. He's been moderate with his win. He stayed in his 720 square foot, $88,000 house. It wasn't until 2011 that Gell purchased a new home for $450,000. Gell is apparently one of those lottery winners who's smart with his money. He now drives around in a 2015 Nissan Rogue SUV. He only buys things when he needs it. His advice to lottery winners? Be really careful. Be frugal. Don't blow it all. Invest. It's really tempting to spend it all. Don't. Number 3. Jack Whitaker. If you're one of those people who read up on lottery winners a lot, you may have heard of Jack Whitaker. He was the winner of a huge 2002 jackpot of $314.9 million in the Powerball. It was the largest jackpot ever won by a single winning ticket at the time. Okay, maybe he doesn't really belong on this list, because what a lot of people don't know is the fact that Whitaker was already a multi-millionaire at the time of the win. He's one of the few rich people who played the lottery for fun. However, his story is too interesting to leave off. And he did win a huge amount of money. I think most people that follow lottery winners know what happens next. Let's just say things got a little weird for Whitaker. Whitaker first gave 10% of his rewards to Christian foundations in Southern West Virginia. He also used $14 million to build up the Jack Whitaker Foundation a non-benefit association that gives nourishment and attire to low-pay families in provincial West Virginia. In addition, he bought the person who sold him the winning ticket a $123,000 house and a brand new Jeep Cherokee. Even after doing these nice things, Whitaker couldn't turn around his luck. His problems started mounting. A year after his win, he was robbed of around $545,000 cash that was in a suitcase in his car. Another year later, the same thing happened again, except this time it was only 200 grand. 
and the money was recovered. Then his granddaughter was found dead, and he was somehow a suspect. Then there were more robberies and more legal troubles that piled up over the years since the lottery win. And oh yeah, his uninsured house burnt to the ground in 2016. Sounds like being a famous lottery winner is probably a lot worse than just being an anonymous rich guy. Hopefully Whitaker's fortune eventually turns around. Number 2. Jonathan Duhamel Jonathan Duhamel is a Canadian professional poker player who's known for winning the biggest event in poker, the World Series of Poker main event. His career earnings took off when he won almost $9 million when he won the 2010 main event title and became the first Canadian player to win the main event title. Before that huge payday, his previous biggest win was around $55,000. After he won, Duhamel chose to give $100,000 of his prize money to the Montreal Canadiens Children's Foundation, which was the biggest donation ever given to them. Duhamel wasn't just a lucky guy who happened to bink a tournament, as he's captured other prestigious titles to fully solidify his status as an elite poker player. As of March 2018, his career tournament winnings total more than $17.8 million. What's your favorite rags to riches story? How would you like to get a few million dollars? By winning the lottery? Or by selling a business? Or by getting a high paying job and saving millions? Let us know in the comments. Number 1. Juan Cohn Imagine working on a business that hasn't really been making money for you for years, but you're absolutely convinced in the idea and the tech behind the idea. You're essentially working for free on the idea, and you're burning through a lot of your personal cash in order to create your vision. However, one day, someone decides to buy your tech, and all of a sudden you're a billionaire. This is essentially the Juan Combe story, as incredulous as it sounds. Back in 2009, Combe purchased an iPhone and understood that essentially, the next big thing was to develop an app within Apple's App Store. Combe decided on developing WhatsApp, as he thought that it would be really cool to have statuses next to individual names on the people in a phone book. The statuses would show if you were on a call, your battery was low, or were at the gym. Comb very quickly picked up the name WhatsApp in light of the fact that it sounded like what's up. WhatsApp essentially became instant messaging with a bunch of great features, such as the famous double check mark that allows someone to know you've read their message. WhatsApp eventually got Facebook's attention. Mark Zuckerberg reached out to Comb, and in February of 2014, Zuckerberg met Comb over dinner and made a proposal to buy WhatsApp for a whopping $19 billion. Of course Comb accepted. I doubt Comb will ever have to stand in line for food stamps like he did when he first moved to California. Here's what's next. 